Howdy y'all, it's your favorite trainer with the belt buckle. Today we're going to go over the fundamentals of programming and understanding progressive overload. If you want to be awesome, if you want to become a successful personal trainer, you got to read the book and look at Milo. We're going to talk about him in a second. We have in-person internships, San Diego, Los Angeles, Austin, October 4th. We're online, we have weekend seminars. You have no excuse not to show up if you want to make this into a career. Turn that passion to help people into a long-term profession. But to be a fitness professional, different than an influencer, you gotta really own the basics. Programming, anatomy, and progressive overload. So let's talk about that. Milo, I gave him a belt buckle. Milo of Croton is badass hunk. E eons ago, and the folklore goes, he took this little calf, put that sucker on his back, walked up to the hill, got some water for the town. He was kind of a weirdo. He would walk around town, always with his calf, turn into a bull. He was massive. Well, the story goes that he would hold fruit, and he would challenge people to move his fingers, because he was that strong. Did it really happen? Absolutely not. Just like Hercules, it's a fun story. The foundation's pretty good though. What happened to his system as he continually progressed throughout life? The bull got bigger, he got bigger. It's the same with tissue. So if you want to develop your fatigue, if you want some cannons, you gotta go back to the basics. So what we're gonna do is go over the nine different kinds of progressive overload, how you can implement that into a program. The program we're gonna go over is how we design our programs at Show Up Fitness. And this is gonna be based off of a transitional pattern, a squat pattern, a unilateral pattern, a hinge pattern, a push and a pull. And so one of the biggest problems I see with new trainers, they lack confidence because they don't understand anatomy. They can't tell you the 17 muscles around the shoulder, the 40 around the hip, and they have no idea how to freaking program. Betsy comes in, 40 years old, wants to lose weight. How do I assess her? Overhead squat assessment, don't you fucking dare. Don't you dare. You need to ask great questions, understand the par Q and the form and the, of the assessment, and then add value and sit her down and sell. We are salesmen. <gasps> Sales is fun. And if you think, and if you have an idea, not an idea, but if you have this figment in your mind that sales is scary, it's gonna be really hard for you to be successful. Sales is fun. So let's go over progressive overload. Easiest one, number one, intensity of load. That's gonna be a five pound weight. I do it 10 reps, workout one. Workout two, which is on Wednesday, non-consecutive days. I'm going to then do the weight five pounds heavier, two and a half pounds heavier. The intensity of the load is progressively getting heavier. Number two is the efficiency of the load. So I have my dumbbells, 10 pounds, one, five, uh, 10. The next time I come in, non-consecutive, same weight, one, five, 10. The neuromuscular aspect with that load is more efficient. That's still progressive overload. Three, four, and five, VFI. Volume, frequency, and intensity. These are the kings and queens for hypertrophy. If you want a big old caboose, you gotta increase the volume. How many times are you training? From two days to three times? The intensity of the effort. And that's gonna be time under tension. It could be unilateral. It could be slowing down the concentric or eccentric forced reps, supersets, drop sets. Six is range of motion. We teach a lot about anatomy. The bicep brachii flexes the humerus, flexes the elbow, supinates the elbow, the radial ulnar joint to be correct. If you come up and do a curl here, Day one, day seven, you get a little bit of supination. You're gonna, watch this, watch this, boom, boom. You get a little more of a contraction. That is a form of progressive overload. Density, 10 sets in an hour. Let's say this is 10 sets right here. It takes you 60 minutes. You can do those same 10 sets a week later in 45 minutes. The density is more efficient. There's also 10 sets day one, 12 sets day seven, in the same amount of period. And so you're doing more work. Intensity of speed. So this is more advanced. You have 135 on the bench, one, 
five, ten. If you really go to volitional fatigue, you get type two recruitment. But as you get stronger and you progress month to month to month, month three, that 135, you pause it on your chest, and you work on maximal velocity. Velocity, the power is force times velocity. This says velocity times distance. I had that wrong. It's force times velocity is power. We teach a CSCS class if you need to pass NSCA. Weekly, bi-weekly classes. We go through the textbook. We'll get you to pass that sucker in 90 days. And last but not least, intensity of body weight. If you have a client who weighs 300 pounds and they do three chin-ups, I'm going off of the sports analogy with the CSCS. He loses 15 pounds and then at the end of the month, he's able to do three chin-ups. That's still progressive overload because the total mass has gone down. So this is the foundation. Most trainers will just do one. They increase the weight or even worse today, they don't progressively overload and we put someone on a BOSU ball because it's harder. Well, what did you do to the load right there? You decreased the optimal force production. Why? Because it's harder. You're absolutely correct. Harder doesn't mean better though. It's harder to drive from San Diego, that's where I'm at right now, to Las Vegas and then go to San Francisco. Does that mean it's better? If you can just go straight up I-5 to San Francisco, train smarter, but also hard, but not stupid by getting on a BOSU ball or doing something one leg and you're now compromising the force production. The foundation of movement is so important, movement competency. Own the mechanics, strengthen your ligaments and tendons. The first month, 10 to 15 reps, own the mechanics. I'm not gonna encourage my clients to press like this. Flaring up, end of the sternum, put your thumb, put your thumb on your belt buckle, should be parallel. All times, if I'm deadlifting, if I'm pressing, maintain that integrity. Progressive overload is having proper form. I focus primarily on one and two. As you get more advanced, you can get into VFI with your clients. Seven through nine is a little more advanced. We don't need to get crazy, but here's where the craziness comes in is due to the trainer's insecurities, where we think the client wants to be entertained. I did squats last time. They don't want to do them anymore. They want to have fun. No, they don't. They want results. And you get results by progressively overloading. So let's take an example of a program for a beginner. And let's, let's give her a name. Let's go with, give me a name, Chris. Janice. Janice. So we have Janice, and she is going to be training with you three times a week. You sold her a packet, $100, 12 sessions for the month, 1,200 big ones. Make sure to put a little bit aside into an emergency account, put some into stocks and taxes, make sure you got that, and then buy me some whiskey. I like whiskey, bourbon. So here's the program you're gonna do with her, jumps, transitional. We're not jumping like Tinkerbell, no. We load back and then we come up. But we're teaching the foundation of a proper jump. So we're not going for maximal height or broad jump. We're just loading and then coming up. Knees tracking over our toes, big toe, little toe, heel on the ground at all times. When we jump, we're gonna land on our toes and then come down. So we teach the fundamentals of proper movement from there, you do maybe five to 10 jumps, go into hip thrust, 10, 15 repetitions. Usually I'll start with 15, planks next. Build on a strong foundation. We don't need to be doing all these crazy movement exercises. I call this an accessory movement, the B. This is circuit one. Next set, I'm gonna still do 10 jumps, proper form. Go into hip thrust, add weight. So I went from 15 out of 12. Planks, same thing, maybe I want to tap my shoe or something because I'm getting involved. We always encourage the trainer to say your client's name at least three times, learn something new, show them a new exercise and get involved. The new exercises can come in the B. After you finish that for three rounds, you go on to the next one. We have a step up, into a chin up, into a side plank. Unilateral pattern, pull pattern, accessory. You can do whatever you want with the accessory. Outside of the first circuit, you could do cardio. You can do corrective exercise. Don't get the cert. But if you want to throw in some corrective exercise, that's fine. If you, your client has an injury, lateral epicondylitis, you want to do some super, super slow wrist curls, that's fine. If your client wants a big old ass, they want to isolate it, you can do some band stuff. Three rounds, progressively overloading each set. 
Last but not least, we have our goblets. Landmine press. A lot safer for the shoulder for most people. We can't own a true military press. We can't even get to 160 degrees of shoulder flexion. We get this flare. So if you have that, I'm not going to have you doing the, a press with bad form. And the jumping jacks. If your client wants some cardio at the end, I'll ask him, how are we doing? I have some glucose tablets if you're a little woozy. If we got a little left in the tank, let me know. And they say, yes, what's your favorite exercise? I love cardio. Throw in some jumping jacks. Maybe you give them an option of three. We can do cardio, we can do biceps, or we can do some stretching, whatever. Make it specific to the client. We do that for three rounds. Workout one complete. Have them sign it off. Check how they're doing the next day. Professionalism. Send them a text. When they come back, the non-consecutive day, because usually they're going to train three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. On Wednesday, she comes in. How are we doing today? She's going to be a little sore, maybe sore than normal, so we might have to modify the program. I typically don't like to do an exercise for a muscle that's really, really sore. So if they come in there, oh, chest is roasted, glutes are so sore. <sighs> okay, well then I might need to modify some of this program. And so she's good to go. So now we're going to implement some of these progressive overload factors. So intensity of load. When I do my hip thrust on Monday, let's say I started out with 10s. I like to use the big black 10s because then you can roll it onto your client. You don't have to pick it up and hurt your back. That's 65 pounds, 10 on each side. So we did 10, added five, added five. So we went up to two 10s per side. 20, 20 plus 45 is a bar. That's 85 pounds. This time I start with 10, do 15, but then I go right to 25s, 20s, which would be 85. Then I put another five on. That's going to be an increase in the intensity of load. We went to now 85 pounds where the last time we went to, sorry, 95 pounds, last time we went to 85. For the planks, when you look at progressive overload, frequency, you can do more, longer, volume, you can do more sets, intensity, if she really kicked ass, you could have her put a hand behind her back. That's really challenging. Make sure it's appropriate. We get into our step ups. Intensity of load. You could use the same load as last week on Monday. Last, I mean, last workout on Monday. And if it's more clean, neuromuscular, the efficiency is still overload. Side plank variations. You can change up the beats. So how this might look on Wednesday is I'm not going to do a plank. I'm not going to do my side plank. I'm not going to do jumping jacks. And how you can modify this, and that's why the program is so great, is you just take the number. So one, two, and three. And for Wednesday, you start with two is number one. So you start with step ups. You can go heavier. Instead of doing chin ups, I'm going to do a push, push up instead of a press. So I just switched the pattern from a pull to a push. And now I'm going to do a variation for a glute exercise. So I do that for three rounds. Now I'm going to go and do this one next. I'm going to do hip thrust first, and then I'm going to do an Aussie, which will be a variation of a pull-up, like a regress version. And then I'm going to do some bicycle exercises. And then I'm going to end off on squats again. But this time I'm going to put a band on my client's knees. And that's going to be intensity of effort, like your time under tension. Same weight. Maybe I slow it down a little bit. Last set, hold at the bottom, do 10 reps out. Create the burn. Focus on tension here. Damage is the whole workout. Increase the reps at the end to get the metabolic stress. Those are the three mechanisms of hypertrophy. Tension is the most important, total damage and stress. VFI is the most important when it comes to hypertrophy. Workout three on Friday. We start out with a squat pattern, but we're going to do a back squat. And then we go back into the push ups, and then we're going to do another ab exercise. Do that for three rounds. Second circuit, hip thrust again. Oh my God, we did hip thrust three times that week. Yes! An inexperienced slash shitty trainer is going to have new exercises every single workout. Think about this for a basketball player. You want to get better at free throws. One day you shoot free throws. The next day you do it with your left hand. The next day you do it with your eyes closed. What? No, both shoot ball free throws. That's stupid. If you want to get better at your sport, you practice. 
So set those expectations during the assessment. We're going to do about 80% of the same exercises. I'm going to throw some stuff in there. You're going to have fun. Most importantly, you're going to get results. When was the last time you worked with a trainer who's educated, that designed a periodized program specifically just for you over a three-month period and you trained with weights three times? Your client's going to say, no, I've never done it. Watch what happens. Throw a guarantee in there. I guarantee you, if you don't miss one of the workouts in the next three months, you'll be in the best shape of your life. For most of your clients who are deconditioned, that's what's going to happen. Confidence is important. They got to show up though. So now we're going to do that at the end, we put hip thrust maybe as the second one, but now this, uh, so we did the hip thrust as the second one. Step ups, we're going to go frontal now at the end. So we're going to go to the side. That's a new exercise to your clients. So we're going to do some jumping jacks, which we did on Monday and Wednesday, but now we put the band on their knees increasing the intensity of effort. Maybe we do some rotations in there. That's new to your client. The following week, I'm still gonna stick to a lot of these. I'm gonna increase the load. Maybe I'll throw in an incline press or a bench press. Typically, I don't get into a lot of upper body load with my girl clients for the first week or two because they're deterred about getting all jacked up. I mean, they're coming to a trainer with giant biceps. They think they're gonna look like me. It doesn't happen, but I respect that. I play the game. So we do a lot of body weight. Once I can tell they're getting a little more comfortable and they trust me more, then I'll throw in a unilateral press. Press is here. As we talk about in our class today, how can you incorporate exercise that will engage the booty while you're doing upper body? So maybe we do a reverse hyper row. Maybe you do a chin up and you do a couple, you hold and you do some abductions. You do a bridge press. You put that, there's the, the, the second exercise, the core pattern. Core pattern, core pattern, accessory. Core pattern, core pattern, accessory. If you train 12 times and your client wants a big ass, you better be doing a bunch of hip thrusts. Nine, 10 times out of those 12 sessions. You're gonna change the load though. If it's in the beginning, it's gonna go heavier. If it's at the end, it's gonna go lighter. You can add on a band. You can do a single leg that's more progressed. But trust me when I say most trainers fail because they don't have very high retention. And that's because they don't focus on the basics because they're insecure and they think they they know what the client wants by changing up the exercises. That's what the B's are for. Show them a new exercise every single time they come in. Stimulate your client's mind with conversation during the rest periods. Day 12, jumps. Maybe I feel it's appropriate to throw a little transition in there. Maybe I go on a box. It's a different exercise for your client. The hip thrust, we set a PR. They started out with 65. The 12th session, we get to 135. Talk about Milo. The first month, we're not going to get a lot of hypertrophy. It's mostly neurological. Months two and three, you're going to see a lot more fat loss and a lot more hypertrophy. Step-ups, maybe you throw in because they're doing really well, you throw in a waiter step-up, a variation along those lines. Get involved. You have them come and you step, and maybe you give some perturbations. Chin-ups, Aussies, dumbbell rows, cable rows, barbell rows. It's the pull pattern, vertically, horizontally. So this is progressive overload. These are the nine variations. And here's an example of a program that you can implement with your clients. Comment, like, subscribe. If you have any questions, you can find us on Instagram, show up fitness internship, show up fitness. And remember, if your favorite trainer with a belt buckle, keep showing up.